price and also our way, our way of working. So we have worked hard together in order to share with you the results of prominent MED project. This virtual conference is part of this work. Two other digital events are planned in order to explain the preliminary and implementation phase of PPI in the project. They will be held the 15th of July and the 22 of July. I will give soon the floor to the speakers who will explain in more details the results of the project. My role here is to guide you and share with you three technical details. The first one, the agenda. We will start, sorry, we will start with the official welcome of Mauro Agostini, the general director of Zilup Umbria. Unfortunately, Paola Gabiti, the Umbria region councillor, will not be able to be present due to institutional commitments. Then, Christoph Meyer from MED, from MED Program Joint Secretariat will explain us the political context where prominent MED was born, the importance of our project and its added value to the Interact MED program. So, Frederick Bugran from the Scientific and Technical Center for Building in France will speak about lessons learned from PPI and in particular, the characteristic of our project that is testing in a specific target, small Mediterranean municipalities. We know that you are here to know how the use of public procurement of innovation can stimulate the adoption of innovative products and services. So we organized the online roundtable managed by Ramona Postol from Corverse. She's expert in international law, innovation, procurement and digital technologies and our panelists, Mauro Draoli from Agit, Italian Digital Agency, expert in procurement strategies and market innovation, Gaynor Wiles from Gera Consulting, expert in innovation procurement for improving public services and stimulating economic opportunities, and Olaz Nicolas from Technalia, expert in integrated rehabilitation and urban regeneration. Second, the microphone. Please remember to switch off your microphone. It is important in order to not have problem with the sound. And third, the questions and answer session. Have, as have you seen in the program, we organize a session and answer session. You have the possibility to ask questions during all the event. So how to ask your question? It's very simple. Just write it in the chat, in the, in the Zoom chat, specifying to whom is addressed. And we'll come back to you after the round table or just let us know. And now let's go to the information that we are waiting for. I'm delighted to leave the floor to Mauro Agostini, the general director of Zilup Umbria. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Valeria. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am very proud to be here with you today and to welcome uh, all government authorities, European partners, and dis distinguished part participants to today's International Conference of a Prominent Men, a European, European project led by Svilup Umbria, the development agency of the region of Umbria that uh, I manage I'm as sorry. director general. This is a very special occasion that, uh, together with the next two appointments, will conclude an uh, enriching three years cooperation path. Let me start by saying that also public procurements don't escape the grip of COVID-19 pandemic. 
The new scenario imposes a new awareness to the managerial class. The pandemic has affected the vital ganglia of the entire country system, overwhelming its rhythms, articulations, and functions. Every aspect of the daily life of people, organizations, and institutions has been revolutionized. New and pressing needs have emerged. The term public procurement is used to identify that part of a public expenditure intended for the direct purchase of goods and services by the public administration and represents a particularly important economic policy level. The PAP, the public procurement, can be used as a policy tool to achieve several objectives, to stimulate the level of, econ of economic activity and create employment, to protect nat national enterprises from global competition by encouraging their investment and growth to, in to increase competitiveness and innovative capacity to reduce territorial disparities. The public procurement of innovation can encourage the dialogue between companies and the public administration by seeking solutions to meet emerging public needs. Prominent MED applies these procedure, procedures to the energy requalification of the public buildings, taking care of the eco, eco sustainability. Prominent MED experience, unique in Italy, brings together the know how gained in terms of innovation with the traditional experience of local authorities and companies. The product and the process innovation inspired by sustainability in which local authorities are investing has been accompanied by cultural innovation and here the most immediate reference goes to recent events with youth movements engaged in the environmental protection. The team of innovation in all its, in all its meanings is one of the pillars of Svilupumbria's activity. This is the end of a project, but this is the start of a wonderful social and political work. It talks about a change of paradigm of after COVID towards a new phase of development and a new relationship between public sector and the private sector. The public tenders have to hold a central role to steer the business, especially of SMEs, to treat the strategic sector, public health, green deal, and digital divide. The post-COVID social economic crisis has generated a reduction of activity levels and innovative management in public procurement can and must make a difference. The post-coronavirus restart will require tackling regulatory challenges in public procurement to ensure, to ensure the relaunch of business activities. The aim is to build balanced transparency competition between business, certainty, and speed. Italy is engaged in an ambitious operation of the transformation, innovation, and digitalization of its bureaucratic apparatus, following an important measure taken by the government, leading quickly, leading quickly, transparently, and effectively 
The resources of the recovery fund is an historic opportunity that our country cannot miss. For an agency as Virupumbria, transparency and accountability are two essential values. This is the reason why we have strongly believed and will continue to believe in this project, especially in the post-COVID era that imposes a leap forward in public ethics. I thank you for your attention and wish you all a very fruitful working session. Good morning. Thank you, Director, for this inspiring speech and for joining us. And thank you for underlying the important role that PPI play in increasing competitiveness in our region in order to reduce territorial differences. And now stay with us and enter in the heart of the project. Unfortunately, Christoph Meyer has technical problems. He's trying to join us. So we'll, we'll leave the, the floor to Frederick Brugran. Can you hear me, Frederick? Yes, yes, I, I can hear you perfectly. So I will uh, share with you my screen. Yes, thank you very much. What about lessons learned of prominent med project? Please, Frederick, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Can you can you see the? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, so good morning, everybody. So I'm very pleased to uh, make this presentation here uh, as a conclusion of this uh, project, which uh, lasted for for three years. So um, uh, I, I'm working at CSTB, and uh, at CSTB we, we we are not following any pilot project. So I was more in the project as an observer, and today I will try to uh, present you the four main key lessons that I uh, that we can uh, grab from from this project. Okay, so I'll go. Maybe, just... Maybe it's better now. Uh, okay, so uh, before presenting you this for reasons, I, I will um, uh, uh, mention the origin of the project. So why PPI and uh, what was the subject of this project and how, how did we achieve uh, the goal that was, uh, that was presented? So the first question is why PPI and why PPI for small and medium-sized municipalities? So first, uh, when we deal with PPI, we deal with innovation. And uh, as you probably know, research and innovation is uh, very important for Europe, 2020. And it is at the center of uh, the strategy to, for smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. So this is the first one. And, and why? Public procurements. Uh, public procurements uh, today is uh, quite uh, important in Europe. If you look at uh, all public authorities uh, that uh, launch every day uh, procurements, altogether at the end of the year it represents about 40% of GDP. So public authorities can have a very strong impact on the growth of the country and also on, on innovation. And uh, as you may be aware now with the crisis, lots of people are expecting public authorities to, to, to launch uh, again projects to, uh, to promote the growth in, in Europe. And uh, another issue was that the PPI is new and in, uh, innovative and um, small municipalities in Europe and particularly in the med countries, didn't have uh, uh, lots of experience with PPI. So this project was particularly relevant to uh, help them to, to gain experience in this type of uh, procurement process. And um, uh, the project was focused on, uh, on energy and renovation, 
and uh, the aim was to reduce energy consumption of public building. And uh, why this target? It's because public buildings uh, account, all buildings in Europe account for 40% of the EU energy consumption, and it represents about 36% of CO2 emission. So boosting public procurement, public procurement is very important if we want to achieve collectively these uh, European targets, that is 32% uh, for energy efficiency by 2030. But the problem uh, is that today, most public authorities are, I will say, risk averse, and they prefer to be traditional and not to promote uh, new solutions. They prefer to, to, be, uh, uh, to, to, to adopt traditional approach and, uh, they, not to, and they, they, they usually prefer to, uh, prefer to, uh, to work with our traditional uh, suppliers. And promoting PPI is uh, doing things differently. And so what, what is the goal of Prominent Med? So first, uh, the goal was to stimulate the adoption of innovative strategy uh, of innovative energy efficient solutions and processes for public building energy refurbishment. So as I told you, um, public buildings represent a high percentage of uh, energy consumption in Europe and uh, promoting uh, energy efficiency in public building is also giving examples for private actors. And the second uh, goal was also to uh, enhance the level of knowledge and experience in, in small municipalities, which didn't have any experience in this field. So uh, in the project, uh, as Valaya explained to you, there were uh, four municipalities, uh, one in Italy, Narni, representing 21,000 uh, inhabitants. And the project was uh, the renovation of the school in Spain, in Hazira, uh, uh, the renovation was more like a, I would say, a transformation from a, from, from a factory to um, buildings uh, for social, for, um, for, for, young, for young people. And um, in Mertola, the renovation project was uh, was concerning uh, an historical building. So it was a municipality, in fact. And uh, the, the, the challenge was to do the renovation by respecting the, the, uh, the historical heritage. And in Croatia, in Koprivnica, uh, the renovation was concerning a kindergarten. So all projects were launched uh, in 2017 and uh, with the aim to um, implement PPI. So what is, uh, what is uh, uh, PPI and how, how do we implement it? So the first question before launching PPI is to be sure that uh, uh, you have uh, knowledge about the market. So PPI is um, the uh, kind of meeting point between uh, the market and uh, you as a public body uh, with, your, with your need. So in, in prominent meds, so the prominent med project was, uh, if you look at this table, was we were more focusing on the uh, right side of PPI. The, the left side, is more when um, you have a need that is not fulfilled by the market, but you need R and D uh, risk, uh, expand. You need to, to pursue uh, R and D expenditure. In our projects, there was um, the aim was to promote solutions that were already available on the market, but that were not very well diffused. And uh, the aim with PPI is to uh, accelerate and to promote the diffusion of products that are or services that are already on the market. So the first issue is to do some preliminary preliminary market consultation, and this is, uh, I would say, probably the most important uh, stage of the project, as you will see later on. 
because you, you need to, uh, once you have uh, identified your need, you need absolutely to, to present to the market uh, to, and to understand what the market can, can achieve. And uh, so then uh, you, you need to procure, of course, your, your project. And uh, the, you have, uh, in, in the prominent case, you have three, uh, solu you had three solutions. It's uh, uh, as a procurement procedure. You can either choose the open procedure, the competitive procedure with negotiation, or the competitive dialogue. And this selection of the procurement procedure will strongly depend, as I, uh, as I will explain you later, on the market engagement that you will, uh, on the results of the market engagement. So now let's go to the, the four lessons from, of the project. So uh, um, in the projects, usually with PPI, starts with needs identification. And then uh, where the public authority uh, has to uh, identify its needs. And then uh, uh, just after, you have the uh, market engagement phase, which helps you to, to select the procedure. But the market engagement phase is very important because it gives you an idea of what is, uh, the what is uh, available in the market and how the market perceives your, uh, your project. And this will help you to select the procedure and then you will award the contract. So uh, in this uh, presentation, I will not go further uh, this step, which is then after the award of the contract, you have the, the, cons the renovation project, but uh, I, I mainly focus on the, on the procurement phase, which is at the core of, of the project of the PPI of the prominent med, which is on PPI. So the first lesson before anything, I think, is to have and to rely on a strong project team. And uh, why is it important to have a strong project team? It's because uh, you will, uh, with a strong project team, your project will be more credible. Your, your, you will uh, have more, um, you, you, the suppliers that will uh, answer to your, to your tender will, um, will be more uh, enthusiastic to, to, ans to answer if they see that you, are, you have a credible uh, project team and then they can ask you questions and that they will get answer. And the problem with small municipalities is that usually the expertise is quite limited. And if we look at all the projects, most of the time in all this, uh, these four experiences, you, you add internal expertise and this expertise were uh, gathering a project manager, a procurement officer, and usually a municipal officer. But with PPI, you go, uh, it's, it, PPI is quite complex, and you need usually expertise that are not available in small municipalities. And that's why it's better if you want to, to follow and to be successful to, uh, to rely also on external expertise. And in most of the projects, this external expertise were uh, expertise on energy efficiency and legal expertise with PPI. And frequently, this expertise was, uh, it's, it's sometimes it's consultant, but also you have regional organization or national organization that can help you to, uh, that can help municipalities uh, by providing them services on energy efficiency or, or on PPI. So this is very important. Uh, I think it's even maybe more important than uh, anything because the project team uh, is the image that the project will present to the supplier. So this is the first, first reason. Second reason is uh, also to, to, to be credible is you need, uh, once you have identified your needs, you need to show the, the market that the, mar the, the market will be, uh, the, you need to show the suppliers that the market will be very wide. And I will just take one example, uh, the case of Croatia. Uh, in Croatia, the project was on a prefabricated building used as a kindergarten. 
And this building was, uh, was about 25 years old. And what the, what the Croatian team did is that they, they looked everywhere in Croatia uh, if there were any similar buildings. And what they found is that there were 25 similar kindergarten in Croatia and none were ever renovated. And uh, also they, they found that uh, municipalities are at the other prefabricated buildings, 60, 60 of them at similar uh, prefabricated building. So that means that as a supplier, if you answer to, to this uh, tender, then you can get some uh, competitive advantage from the next generation of, of call for tender. So that's, that's how you, you can make, uh, you can uh, express uh, and, and show the, the suppliers that by uh, answering to your call, they, they, they will also uh, have a first uh, advantage for the next generation of call for tenders dedicated to true innovation. So this is very important because when we deal with renovation, uh, we, we sometimes can find, uh, I will say, kind of some of industrialized process. And, and this is uh, the goal of, uh, of the approach that was followed in, in, in Croatia. So this is the first, uh, second lesson. So third lesson, as I explained you, and I, as you can see in the, in the presentation, uh, uh, market engagements is between needs identification and the selection of the procedure. And market engagement as a very, is at the core of PPI and has a very strong impact on the results of the project. I, I will say that, um, that in the four projects in uh, Croatia, in Italy, in Spain, and in Portugal, all the stakeholders agreed to say that uh, they learn a lot with market engagement. And usually, uh, because usually public authorities, they don't, uh, they don't like to be in contact with the suppliers before the tender. But with market engagement, you discuss with, uh, with the supplier before the, the tender. And this is, you have to understand that this is legal. This is uh, completely allowed as soon as you respect uh, the rules of, of the tender. And by doing this, it's a way to give the market uh, a, a way to appreciate, to appreciate the appetite of the market and its capacity to answer to, to your needs. So this is, this is quite important. This is very important. And the second aspect that is that the market engagement will also help you to select the procedure. So if you, case, if you take the case of uh, all of our four pilot projects, as you can see on, on this slide, all the projects decided to, to use a different uh, procurement procedure. In Spain, they decided to, to select the open procedure. And why did they do that? In Spain, they did a very, uh, the, the project was mainly focusing on, uh, on, on windows. They were renovating buildings, but they, were, they focused mainly on windows. And what they did is that they did a very, very strong market analysis. Uh, they identified more than one, 100 suppliers, 160, I think, about that. And then they had a very detailed analysis of, of the markets, and they considered that it was not necessary because of this, their knowledge about the markets, they considered that it was not necessary to, to, to select another uh, approach than the open procedure. In Croatia uh, and Italy, they, they used the competitive procedure because also they knew very well the market, but the procedure was used to discuss more the way they, they would implement the solutions. And in uh, Portugal, they used a competitive dialogue because they, they were still skeptical about the, the use of the, they didn't know exactly the, which technical uh, solution to implement. And for them, it was also a good way to, to learn about competitive dialogue, which was never implemented in Portugal. And the last key lessons, uh, lessons concerning market engagement is that the last point is that uh, the resources you, you engage in this phase have to be uh, uh, in proportion with uh, the size of the tender. 
meaning that it's, it's probably not necessary to spend too much time and resources if the market is limited. But if your market is big, then you, you can be, uh, you can spend more, more resources. Last lessons uh, concern the coherence between the award criteria and the promotion of innovation. Because you deal with PPI, you can't select uh, and you can have a road criteria focusing on price. You, you need to go, you need to go further and uh, you need to integrate uh, quantitative criteria and qualitative criteria. So in most, I would say not in most, in all the projects, they, they, they use this criteria. And sometimes the price was, was almost uh, nothing in the road criteria. If you take the case of Portugal, the price was only 10% uh, in, in the, as, a, as a criteria. So you, you see by selecting different award criteria, focusing more on the, on the quality, you, you will promote or focusing on quality or, on, or sustainability or innovation, you will promote more um, new solution and you will attract suppliers that have very innovative solutions. So all all these elements are, are very, uh, all of these elements, the market engagement, the overall criteria, the, the project team and the needs identification are, are very current. So last thing as a conclusion, and it's, it could be also like kind of, this conclusion could be uh, uh, almost like the, the fifth lesson, is uh, I found it very important as an observer to, to see that in all the projects, you had, uh, uh, at least one actor uh, that uh, represents, in fact, several municipalities. Like if you take uh, and if you take the crash in Croatia, you had Reanors, uh, and in, in Reanors is an energy uh, agency, but they represent uh, not only one municipality; they they can also support other municipalities in North uh, Croatia. Similarly, in Italy. Suilu Pembria uh, is a regional agency. Like in Portugal, it's not only one municipality, it's an uh, intermunicipal community. And in Spain, this, uh, the Consorti de la Ribera, represents uh, 47 municipalities. So the point here is that in the project, uh, all the approach that was developed was quite new. And uh, this and we can uh, assume that, for example, in, uh, in Mertola or in uh, Alzira, they will not do maybe very soon PPI because maybe they will not renovate more building uh, very soon uh, because they are, they are small municipalities. But because uh, these agencies represent several municipalities, other municipalities that in, intend to renovate their building could benefit from the experience gathered by, by these uh, actors involved in the, in the project. So uh, I think this is important, very important to have this type of actor who can learn and diffuse knowledge and experiences. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, just one uh, last point, uh, just to give you an example. Uh, in France, there is a uh, we, we tend to promote energy performance contracting and uh, the region that is where, uh, that where you see the, the real and strong diffusion of energy performance contracting is the, is the region where, where you have such a regional agency that gather experiences on energy performance contracting and then all the municipalities depending from this agency can benefit from, from, from the, this experience. So I, I think that because of the presence of these actors, PPI, PPI will be able to, to diffuse maybe in, in, this, uh, in this region. So thank you for your attention. And now uh, I'm, uh, if there is any question, I'm, I'm ready to, to answer to any. Thank you very much, Frederick, for your speech and thank and thank you for remembering us the important role of the partners to diffuse the results of our project in other municipalities and for, show, for showing us in practice the results of the in the small municipalities of the project. 
Unfortunately, Christoph Meyer, he is still trying to solve technical problems. We have learned during the lockdown that technology needs time and patience. Let's cross the, the fingers. We hope that Christoph will join us. And now before leaving you in the brilliant company of Ramona and their panelists, I remember the possibility to write questions in the chat. We'll collect them and come back to you later. So how the use of public procurement of innovation can stimulate the adoption of innovative products and services? And how can this instrument make the difference in order to improve the quality of the services for citizens? It's time to find it out. It's a big pleasure for me to give the floor to Ramon Apostol from Corvers, who will be in charge to coordinate the online round table. Please, Ramona. Floor is yours, and let's introduce your panelists. Thank you, Valeria, for the kind uh, introduction. I uh, will also give you a little bit of background for myself. I am uh, a lawyer by profession, and I have also an academic interest in innovation procurement. I have a PhD from University of Leiden on uh, the instrument of pre-commercial procurement, referring to R&D uh, procurement, research and uh, development services. Um, and I am uh, working as a consultant uh, for a, a company in the Netherlands, and we are particularly focusing on public authorities, supporting public authorities in deploying um, most complex projects, uh, uh, ICT-related, pre-commercial procurements or procurements of uh, innovative solutions. And also I am uh, often uh, performing as uh, um, expert for the European Commission in, um, in uh, awarding uh, funding and um, uh, assessing the performance of the EU funded project. Um, I will introduce uh, first my uh, outstanding experts in this panel, um, two of which have been involved in the Prominent Med uh, project. We will engage in um, hopefully a lively discussion on the role of innovation procurement and of innovation procurement policy for small municipalities, which are the target group of our uh, webinar today. We are uh, purposely thus focusing on the needs of small municipalities to, to uh, make it uh, more uh, useful, valuable for you, the discussion. And we are focusing specifically on the instrument of innovation, uh, public procurement of innovative solutions, so PPI, because this has been also the, um, uh, the instrument used in prominent med. So we are not discussing R&D uh, procurement. Um, I have with me uh, three wonderful guests. I will start introducing them. I will start with Mrs. Gaynor Wiles. She's director of uh, Jera Consulting, specializing in demand-driven innovation and innovation procurement. Gaynor has over 20 years of experience in this field as consultant and trainer for governmental organizations across Europe. She has also worked as expert for the European Commission in a number of roles. For example, she was one of the four appointed experts in the mutual learning exercise in innovation-related procurement. Another interesting activity from her rich, uh, rich CV is that she has coordinated and developed the well-known uh, forward commitment procedure in the UK in which uh, public authorities um, uh, inform the market well in advance about their need for an innovative solution. And uh, they do not provide funding, but they do provide their commitment to purchase this innovative solution if the market develops it within this uh, timeline that they offer, they have offered. And uh, Gaynor has also overseen the implementation of this instrument in numerous uh, projects across Europe. Gaynor is a graduate in biology and philosophy at the Imperial College of uh, University of London. My second guest is Olat uh, Nicolas. She is a researcher at Technalia in the Department uh, for Building Technologies. She is an architect by profession with a bachelor in environmental design in the US. 
And uh, she has extensive experience in retrofitting construction projects, which is very relevant for the topic of our webinar, and has participated in numerous international EU-funded projects related to uh, energy. She has, for example, been coordinator, technical experts in uh, different EU-funded or national uh, projects uh, on uh, PPI. She has uh, also provided uh, technical assistance in the prominent MED project for the municipality uh, um, of Alzira in uh, Valencia. Um, and uh, she will share with us uh, also from, from this experience, uh, as well as uh, Gainer Wiles, who also supported the prominent project. Last but not least, of course, Mr. Mauro Drauli. He is head of the unit of uh, procurement strategies and market innovation at Agentia per l'Italia Digitale. And he's professor of computer sciences, uh, science at Tor Vergata University in Rome. Uh, he's an engineer by profession with a master degree from University of Rome and has extensive experience in coordination projects and in advising national authorities to the, at the highest political level. In his current position, Mauro is promoting open innovation procurement and he's uh, promoting collaboration between academia, industry and governments in order to, to uh, enhance economic development and technological innovation. So as you can see, we have a very diverse uh, panel in terms of background and uh, expertise. So I am very enthusiastic in uh, listening to what they have to uh, share with us. And um, yeah, I am, we are discussing here uh, small municipalities, small ambitious municipalities who want to solve their challenges in an innovative, in a smart way. So uh, we know, know and you know best if you are um, uh, working in a small municipality that uh, they are facing numerous challenges and uh, they, um, uh, these range, uh, I don't know, from traffic congestion to safety in public spaces to reducing energy consumption in public buildings or energy consumption in, uh, uh, public spaces, um, uh, think of sensor-based uh, sprinkles for sprinklers for green spaces or lighting in this area, public areas. Uh, municipalities might want to um, communicate effectively with their citizens through city apps. So they might uh, want to engage in designing all these uh, ICT solutions, smart ICT solutions in which they um, uh, make available information to their citizens but also receive information from citizens, for example, on malfunctions or unsafe situations in the public space. Um, you can think of uh, landslides that you have in small municipalities in, um, in mountainous areas. You can think of uh, them wanting to develop solutions for monitoring or early warning of such events. Um, Con examples could continue. So uh, I think I convinced you that um, innovation is needed and, um, and I hope we will convince you that also is beneficial and it is not difficult to, to uh, engage uh, in innovation procurement. But we do hear it very often and we've heard it in the previous presentation that innovation procurement is challenging, that public buyers are risk averse and they don't willingly engage in, in such risky uh, innovation procurement um, projects. So I would like to ask my, uh, my panelists of today, what is their message for the small municipality who, municipalities who are with us today and hopefully are thinking of initiating an innovation um, procurement, a PPI? Uh, is it difficult for a small municipality to engage in uh, PPI? And I would give the floor to, um, to Gaynor Wiles. Thank you very much, Ramona, for your lovely introduction. Um, well, actually, I think there are certain advantages to being a small municipality. Um, having worked in a number of city authorities, um, while they may have bigger budgets, they are complicated <laughs> or and large organisations. And they're often characterised by having a lot of um, what I would call departmental silos. And that means that these departments are not very good at actually working across uh, departments, which is a really useful thing to be able to do when you want to innovate. And they can get quite stuck 
in a particular way of doing things. Um, okay, so it, it's almost you could imagine that, that a large organization like a, a city authority is like a big company. You know, sometimes they're less agile than uh, smaller companies, small SMEs. And in these larger organizations, the procurement practices can be highly entrenched um, with what I might call a sort of procurement conveyor belt, where there's this automatic renewal of a tender as it comes up, uh, as you go forward. Whereas I think a small municipality has the potential of being much more agile and therefore able to innovate a lot more easily. Um, and because they're, they're, they tend to be less complex, they obviously have probably have fewer hierarchical sort of lines, as it were, that can really help them um, to engage as a group and engage as an organization towards innovation. And I guess if you're a supplier, you're often looking for ways um, and also places in which you can trial your innovations. And a small municipality, can offer this kind of uh, facility to a supplier just as easily um, as a city authority. And they can also be first adopters or early adopters of innovative solutions. Um, but in the end, I think it always comes down to leadership. Whether you're a large organization, small um, municipality, in the end, if you've got consistent leadership that's open to innovation and creates a culture of innovation, and indeed rewards innovation, um, then you, you, you're just creating an environment where innovative, not only innovative processes, but innovation and, and companies can actually flourish. So with the right leadership, I think that small municipalities can be really important drivers and enablers of innovation for the benefit of their citizens and um, their local economy. Thank you, Gaynor. You convinced me. Um, I would like to move to Olatz uh, Nicolas and uh, see maybe she has a different opinion. Is What do you think, uh, Olatz? Is it difficult for small municipalities to do a PPI? I, th I, think, it's, um, it's, I think it's difficult um, to, to make, um, to change our business, business as, as usual. Uh, the things that uh, how we uh, usually do things uh, to to move forward and change uh, the the pressure the how we th do things, but I I agree totally with uh, Gaynor that uh, we have to move forward, uh, and if uh, small municipalities want to provide uh, good services uh, and better services for their citizens. Uh, there is uh, there is the need of a, a change of uh, mindset, uh, especially for the for these um, public ser uh, servants of the of the municipalities. So I think it's a it's a big challenge for for small municipalities, but I think that uh, with the right uh, leadership, um, it, it it can be it can be done, and it's uh, been proved through a project as prominent met. As we will go on explaining on the next um, webinars, how it's been done. Uh, I think that, of course, uh, you have to have that, um, as Frederick was mentioning, that uh, is a strong project team that supports and, and really is uh, for, for uh, this challenge of, of um, changing things, uh, of how things are, are done. Uh, but also, I think that uh, that is important to to get people uh, on board, uh, expertise, because I think that expertise might be maybe uh, a little bit well, it's probably limited in small municipalities. But there are a lot of organizations and consultants that are willing to uh, to provide their services and their expertise. Uh, to to the to the public authorities at local level, uh, so all these uh, uh, suppliers to to help suppliers to develop uh, new technologies, innovation solutions, innovative solutions uh, that really will help the um, citizens to go on for uh, with better services and solutions. 
Thank you, Olat. I'm curious whether Mauro uh, can add to that because I hear from both of you, Olat and Gaynor, that the intrinsic um, uh, need for innovation should come from inside the uh, uh, procuring authority and from the leadership of the organization with some expertise engaged from uh, external expertise engaged. I'm curious whether Mauro uh, can add to that whether there are any external stimuli that can drive, nudge the small authorities into engaging in innovation procure procurement. Mauro, please. Thank you, the monetary body. Maybe you can speak a bit uh, closer to the microphone if possible. Let's try. Let's try. It's uh, better now. Yes, yes. Okay, so. Um, in, uh, in a critical world, the answer is uh, no, it's easy. In, the, in a concrete world, the answer probably is uh, it's difficult. Yes, it's difficult. Um, my view is that, uh, first of all, what is a small municipality? Because we have a different size uh, um, of municipalities in Europe. Uh, by example, Italy has a really small municipalities. Some of them uh, have something like 100 inhabitants. But, um, and, and this is this is one point. Probably we are speaking of uh, um, cities with uh, thousands of inhabitants. But in many cases, and uh, my perception is that. Um, probably small municipality really should not have um, the um, legal and professional skills to afford a, a, an innovation procurement uh, process. Um, probably because they really do not need them. Um, what is needed probably is to have a, a a public support uh, to some services uh, to support and help uh, small uh, administration, small municipality to, uh, let's say, to, to, to give them the possibility of exploiting their capability of putting on the market their needs, their social needs, their economical needs, their, uh, because usually in a small municipality we, we, find, we can find a very deep knowledge very concrete knowledge of what the citizens need and what, what the territory needs but uh, probably we find the legal technical professional capacities to uh, manage an innovation procurement so my my opinion what we have in Italy is to have a distributed system um, managed by the government that where the professional skills are engaged and that can support uh, more municipalities in supporting their innovation process. Um, it's what sometimes we, we call in Italy innovation public procurement broker. Uh, that is something that is in the middle between the demand and the offer, and that can uh, rise up the dedication and the power of uh, small demand coming from uh, uh, municipalities, even using aggregation of demand. Uh, in this case, um, innovation procurement. Uh, in small municipalities is, is possible. Uh, today we are uh, talked by Unica, and uh, this is an example of uh, a regional entity that could have this kind of role. Uh, together with a national entity like uh, the agency that I represent today, uh, we, as, as a national agency, we are fully aware that it is not possible for us stay very close to the territory, to the small municipality. What we can do is organize a distributed system where uh, different uh, Italian regions, but uh, this kind of model could be, could be replicated in other countries, can
can be very close to their uh, customers, let's say, that are the business environment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mauro. So uh, you want to bring the knowledge on uh, PPI closer to uh, small municipalities in order to, to enable uh, them to access easily this knowledge and dare to take the first, uh, take the leap into innovation procurement. Um, I, I, uh, share, I share this, uh, I share uh, the same opinion with uh, all of you. And I uh, believe, um, yeah, the right expertise, having the right expertise in place and having uh, not just the right expertise, but having um, a grip of a methodology of the steps you have to undertake in innovation procurement uh, really gives the, in any, any contracting authority, not just small, but so larger ones, uh, the, the courage to, to engage and the certainty that they know what they are doing and towards where they are uh, heading towards. And this is also, uh, I want to make a parenthesis, this is what the European Union has been uh, trying. I mean, the EU has started since 2000 to think about uh, innovation, how important innovation is for the uh, European Union. In 2004, they, 2004, 2005, they started uh, looking at innovation uh, uh, procurement and they had this Wilkinson uh, expert group and report um, looking at how to um, how to uh, do innovation procurement within the legal framework that was in place at the moment. And later, um, they also uh, started looking at other countries that perform better than the EU. At the time, it was uh, only the US and Japan. In, in the meantime, we have been taken over by China and South Korea in many indicators related to innovation. So EU has also looked at R&D procurement that is uh, uh, well uh, uh, well performed in the US and uh, uh, gives uh, good results there. So we've had this pre-commercial procurement from the EU. And the EU lately, is, um, uh, because guidance and expertise is uh, at, uh, from a far distance, is very difficult. Uh, it's not picked up easily by uh, local authorities. They have uh, uh, provided funding. And uh, most recently, I want to mention the EAFIP uh, initiative, European Assistance for Innovation Procurement, which uh, I uh, had the honor to, to, uh, to be involved in from the beginning uh, with uh, my company. And uh, we have, I really warmly uh, recommend the uh, audience to take a look at this, uh, the EAFIP toolkit that we uh, prepared uh, in, uh, um, in this contract for the commission. And uh, it's uh, freely available on the website of the EAFIP to familiarize yourself with innovation procurement approach and to understand what the steps, uh, the steps are in this, uh, this procedure, how you can uh, take the first steps and uh, have a plan on uh, how to approach it. Um, I want to move to the next uh, question I want to address uh, to the uh, uh, panel um, is another uh, a very specific uh, uh, difficulty that is often, uh, often um, invoked and that causes often uh, delays or um, deters uh, small municipalities from engaging in innovation procurement, that is the rigid legal framework. Um, I, um, I come from the Netherlands uh, and uh, here public procurement is civil law based. This means that uh, freedom of contracting is an important principle that, that leads the courts uh, to, to um, judge marginally on the decisions taking in, taken in the public uh, procure, procurement uh, procedures. Uh, so you will hear, you will read that uh, courts uh, often say that contracting authorities enjoy wide freedom in assessment and valuation of the offers, that some subjectivity is unavoidable, and this is really a quote from, uh, from many, um, many uh, court uh, cases. Um, I am curious what your opinion is on the importance of a flexible legal framework uh, for procurement for a municipality. Is it uh, is it just the legal uh, framework in abstracto, or is it also the flexibility or the, the open-mindedness of the legal uh, experts involved in, in searching the, the, the full flexibility of the, that the uh, legal framework offers? Uh, and I will, I will start with uh, Mauro. Okay. Um... So really, um, my opinion is that um, the, le the, the legal framework we have is good enough, um, especially for what regards the new directive. 
the European directive give us a set of tools or procedures from uh, dialogue, from negotiation, uh, and um, uh, partnership, and so on. And they can, um, and they are also flexible. They are flexible. Uh, it's possible to have a step-step procedure uh, where you can adapt your um, uh, your mix and also your decision uh, according to the uh, how the procedure is going on. But uh, for specifically for what regards Italy, that uh, of course I know better, uh, problems are mainly in details. That is uh, our um, uh, procurement law, that is, of course, based on the European directive, had a, a set of details that are a sort of a additional, additional task that uh, are in charge of the procurement agency, the contracting authority, uh, that really can. Uh, the store by give an, an additional effort that are either mainly, I can say, external to the procurement process. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but, but this is mainly uh, um, an Italian process. Um, even if, uh, when I speak with some colleagues coming from other countries, I see that uh, everybody has some problem uh, in, uh, in, uh, in applying their own legal uh, case. So, um, in, any case, in any case, I go back to the previous uh, question because um, in the entry of the legal framework, which now we will have in the future, the, the task and the uh, Goal of the procurement of, of procurement between the innovation needs uh, specific fields and expertise, and also some assets that uh, cannot be uh, in the small municipalities. Mm -hmm. Just to, an example, uh, I want to buy innovation. Mm -hmm. I want to present my need to the in to a community of innovators in the market. Uh, really, if I have this community, this network, I, I'm a small municipality, probably not. And uh, having a community or a network or relation with uh, um, the market, the offer of innovation is master. And it's an also a matter of uh, Let's say reputation and um, of the contract authority, uh, the fact that the contract authority or the uh, entity uh, um, is a point of reference for the market of innovation and the market recognized in that point as the point of interest, also of the interest of economical interest. So they are ready to. To hear something from the point of reference, so you Umbria or uh, other regional agencies, or in case of the bigger um, initiatives of the national agency, these are the point of reference also for the market. And uh, I went back to the previous um, question, but I feel that. Um, it's not feasible to have the seed be distributed everywhere in thousands of small municipalities. Uh, innovation procurement is, a, uh, is not a day by day task. Uh, it's something that is extraordinary or, in, in some sense, quite rare, uh, mainly in small municipalities. So, probably it doesn't make sense for a small municipality to set up a specific group, a specific office to afford this kind of initiative that probably uh, arrives one time uh, 
every year or every year. Mm -hmm. uh, better things have um, uh, help coming from specific entities that can be specialized. specialized in yeah. The yeah, thank you, Maurer. So I, I understand. So it's important for a small municipalities to be able to tap some into some knowledge that is available, that is at hand, whenever they want to uh, engage in innovation procurement. And I, I would like to stress <laughs> also that innovation procurement is fun. It's not, it should not be something that uh, small uh, municipalities should be afraid of because they, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's great to, to, to uh, perform such a project. So I, I really warmly encourage you getting out of the routine of the regular procurement and engage in, in, in an innovation procurement because it enriches your insights, your view on the market. It can be with the right type of support and knowledge, it, um, you will um, uh, enjoy it even. Um, <laughs> uh, Olat, um, would you like to add something to that, please? Um, yeah. Um, well, I'm not a um, public law, law expert <laughs> in any case. Perhaps you can uh, share how legal yeah. framework has impacted you in your project. How What was your yeah. perception? You often and also, have lawyers that block everything and they know all better and the technicians <laughs> are frustrated. <laughs> and especially, um, well, uh, we've been... Um, doing uh, PPI projects uh, before the, the European directive was in place. So uh, the Papyrus project was one of them. And uh, we had to a lot of challenges because we didn't have um, a legal framework in which, uh, which will, will uh, support us on um, doing this kind of uh, processes. But I think that once the, the European directive came in place, uh, the uh, this uh, directive was uh, trans transposed to the to the member states' uh, uh, laws le le legislation. I think that um, many of the the uncertainties that were on um, were on these kind of processes uh, they they provide confidence to the to the public procurers. Uh, things like um, market engagement, for example, which was a big uh, issue. Uh, how are we going to, to engage the market before uh, having the, the, uh, all the documents presented or things like that that were not uh, really regulated? I think this uh, gives the floor um, to, to really um, provide this uh, legal background so they are confident now of uh, how they can do it and they are under the principles of a, a, a transparency and everything so that gives them confidence to, to do it uh, also the, the the way to award the criteria uh, i think it's a it's a, a it's a big a input that they are the spanish a contract law a provided um so that they can um so that so that that kind of a, a confidence to the to the public procurers it's it's good on the other hand uh, i think that there are some other legal issues uh, which are still um, um are barriers such as the um related to the budget to the municipal budgeting I think that uh, those are things that still have to be improved. Uh, but this, I guess that uh, that has another um, um, framework. Let's say yes. uh, <laughs> we have to overcome to, to, to overcome those uh, annual municipal budgets because I, we know that PPI is a long process. Uh, we cannot uh, budget. I guess that in. in for Europe or maybe in, in, in Spain, it's annual. So um, we have to, to start uh, providing this uh, the allowance or, or this uh, budgeting issues, um, a, a different thought also about uh, how to, to, to go on with them because implementation periods are much longer than the traditional procurement. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I uh, I agree. I agree, and uh, I mean, from from a 
procurement legal framework uh, point of view, I think wherever there's a gray area, such as in the market consultation, when not all the details are uh, laid out in the legislation, because market consultation normally falls outside the, the, the scope of the legal rules that are defined in the directives, it's very important to have an authoritative guidance from either from the European Commission or from a national agency. And also in the, for example, in the AFIP initiative where we have supported so far since 2015, 18, we have supported 18 uh, uh, projects, local projects, national projects, so not EU funded. The only EU support is our uh, expertise, the assistance we provide to the project, and they have, uh, uh, it helps to have the backing of such a guide that is also has the support of the European Commission, and people trust that is the right way to go forward, and they do dare to, to engage, uh, despite some uh, doubts they might have based on the national legislation. And we also, in the AFIP initiative, we have a network of lawyers that can support the, the project. So uh, for those, uh, for those in the audience who uh, are interested you uh, follow up the uh, the initiative there might be uh, new calls for uh, for supporting you i would like to ask uh, gainer uh, now um, is on on what what types of uh, obstacles she has encountered in in um, ppi projects she has uh, supported uh, that perhaps relate to legal framework or uh, to to other types of uh, of obstacles and uh, what is her view on uh, overcoming these uh, obstacles thank you Roman. i first of all i just want to echo your um message that it's fun <laughs> <laughs> it would be so boring to do just uh, just but, regular things <laughs> yeah, and it really is a career enhancing process like the yeah. problem i keep i keep um training people in organizations and then they get headhunted <laughs> yes yes, yes. <laughs> um, so really it is a very very positive thing in so many ways and the it not only is it a much more creative process, it actually brings, bridges the gaps um, across an organization because we bring together cross departmental teams. We actually start engaging with the end users and really understanding what's, what's going on. Just great. And there was one fabulous example um, when we were working in the early days in Poland um, where we were looking at uh, low carbon uniforms uh, which was a it's a, it, a very you know so oh, we thought we'd start simple they were going to buy uniforms anyway when they started digging they really understood that all the carbon was really not well it was in the growing of the cotton um, but also in the washing of these uniforms so they you know it was like oh okay it, th those are really heavy cotton uniforms and they take a long time. They and they, they were actually buying their laundry contract by weight, mm. so it was also costly. It was, it was just and all this sort of embedded carbon and operational carbon being used up here. Um, and so I sort of said, "Well, have you?" And also, have you spoken to the people that wear these uniforms? They went, "Oh, can we do that?" <laughs> you go and talk go and talk to the nurses and the nurses loved this they thought this is no one's ever asked us anything before and so they were able to point out that they were uncomfortable they were hot they shrank they had no maternity version of this uniform you know so many things that the pen, there was nowhere to put a pen anywhere you know um and i i just remember the this um the person i was working with in in poland she came back and she said I love this work. This is great, you know. So it does. It just brings that. It brings creativity and it releases um, not only creativity in the supply chain, but creativity um, within the organisation as well. But um, coming back to your, your question about the barriers, well, I, when I started out I think fifteen years ago, it was clear that there was some in some organisations there were there was a kind of mythology. Um, of procurement that you weren't allowed to do things and market engagement was a classic we're not allowed to talk to the market and it's like where does it say that it doesn't say that anywhere um, and the other thing was I, I'd call this black box professionalism okay and by that meaning 
that you know that the my that I'd be working for example with colleagues in the facilities department of a hospital and they would wheel in the procurement person who would sit there and basically just say no 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 and no and you go why in, in, the, in the be sucking of the teeth and shaking of heads and going why and that was one of the reasons it's useful to have someone else from outside the organization in that process um, where you can actually call that person out and just say well show us where it says we can't do this um, and also you know, it, 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 being a, an external facilitator working with people in a group you might start to find conflicts um, I was we had a we were working on a project in the hospital looking at catering and it ended up being a fabulous fabulous project but there was a point where it just became it, it became stagnant and it stood still and I, you could start to see that there was the clinical nursing staff on one side and the facilities department on the other. The facilities department was saying, no, we do these evaluations of, of catering and we always get really good results from it. And then, and then nurses would just sit there silent. Okay. So the one day where there was nobody from the facilities department, you can ask the question, so what do you think? Oh, it's terrible. The catering is awful. It doesn't, mm -hmm just can release it brings out the elephant in the room um, and it, you just become this intermediary so that's really useful um, to have that external facilitation is really useful but coming back to these sort of barriers um, th there was a deep resistance to market engagement and talking to suppliers and that was one of the reasons that we said okay we're going to have to create a process that people feel safe following and also that helps to manage the risk of innovation procurement, not only for the customer, but for the supplier. So we designed this, the forward commitment procurement process, which is this three stage process. It's not linear, it's staged, which is your preparation stage, your market engagement stage, and then your pro innovation tendering stage. And any point in that process where you can't justify moving to the next stage then you just stop you know and as a supplier okay well we've looked at the market engagement we realize this isn't for us we, we, we don't need to worry about this tender anymore it's just not going to be for us and also what we made sure is that process was designed with the office of government commerce who are very supportive of it and in collaboration with other stakeholders most importantly with suppliers so we checked this out and said, would, is this the sort of process that would work for you? And they were just going, this is gold dust. You know, this is brilliant. This will transform um, our ability to engage with public sector procurement if we do it in this way. And the point you made also uh, was, it was really good, which is people would say, oh, so we can, it has now become more clear. We always could do market engagement, but now it's clear in the directives that it's explicitly encouraged. How? And so what we what we do is just put, say, oh, can you do this? Then you do this, and then you do this. And here is a template for each of these stages. And it sounds like a lot of work, but actually at each stage, you're just building on the next and it becomes a very, very natural process. Um, the, the other thing I could say is that people have said, okay, the pre-PI process can look intimidating and it can look long. And one of the big learnings from one of our projects that was called SEPI, which is looking at energy efficiency um, in cities, was that you can always do something to support innovation. If the overall PPI process looks too much or you're encountering too much resistance, just do one part of it. And then that in itself will improve your procurement process. So talk to suppliers, okay? Use an outcome-based specification. Yeah. And I, I would also, I'd also say, you know, competitive dialogue is we always seriously recommend considering this very carefully. Do you really want to buy an innovation without talking to suppliers? Do you really want to do that? 
Um, and so I'm, I'm a great fan of competitive dialogue. People's resistance to it can be, it takes too long, it takes too much time. If you have done a good and effective market engagement process, it completely smooths the way for a competitive dialogue or indeed any other procurement process, because a lot of the questions have been answered and that you've honed everything down before you get to the tendering stage and you've got much more clarity. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say you can always do something and innovation partnerships. I don't know why there aren't more of them. You know, I, I and better and better ones. <laughs> I would add. <laughs> You can't, you can't blame the tool for the way it gets applied. Oh, no, no, no. And, and I have now found, because I'm desperate to talk to my, one of my new projects about innovation partnerships, I've now found one that's been completed. So I'm really, <laughs> I'm really mm -hmm. excited about that. And I just think, just look at that process. See mm -hmm. what sense mm -hmm. it makes. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, that was helpful. Thank you very much, Gaynor. Yeah, so I, I, if I have, I would summarize it with, you know, you need um, enthusiastic people, a good team, a task force that is willing to engage in innovation procurement. And it's, I'm, I know it's not difficult. You will always have enthusiastic people in each organization that would like to engage in this, but they also need a safe environment to, uh, to, to be able to, to perform. And it, it comes from support from their management and it comes from tools and methodologies that they can, and also perhaps external, uh, uh, the external input that uh, is not engaged in any of the, the organizational culture uh, or organizational uh, frictions. And um, I also very important that what you mentioned is, is know what you want. Take the time to, to, to uh, look at operations, how it is working now for you, where are the problems, where are the points that you want to improve. Talk to the people who are actually using the solution that you want to buy. They know best what, how it's working and what, how it can work better, what functionalities they would like to have and that would uh, help improve their work um, effectiveness. And um, look at the costs because we haven't stressed this enough uh, so far. Look at, look at your business case or maybe value case. Look at how much does it cost you now to perform a, a public service, a public task. And um, it would help you to understand how much are you willing to invest in the new innovative solution? Look at the cycle, life cycle cost of the solution and then the cost in the whole life cycle. And look at uh, how much, uh, for example, you can get so many insights from a business case or a value case. You could understand how long you should use the innovative solution. And perhaps it costs a bit more in the beginning, uh, acquisition costs, but after a couple of years of using the innovation solution, you will gain uh, financially. So, um, uh, having all these elements in place, so it starts with the need, the needs identification, needs assessment, uh, be, making your business case, making costs and benefits calculation, and then move to the market with all this preparation and have the market validate your findings, telling you whether you it's realistic, it's viable, giving you suggestions on how to uh, how to launch the call. I would go to the last question, Valeria. Can you help me? Whether we still have time? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Ramona, we have time. Okay, thank you. So I will go to the last question because the title of our session is Innovation Procurement Policy. So um, we have to ask the question, uh, what do you think is the role of um, innovation procurement uh, policy? Uh, could be at national, regional, uh, local, uh, organizational level in stimulating the, the small municipalities in innovation procurement. And um, I will uh, start with OLATS because uh, I, I want to be very fair in the order. <laughs> First. Thank you. Time to go first. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think that um, well, I don't know if, if uh, small municipalities have a, or need really big innovation strategies. I don't think so. I think it's um, it's probably it comes from from regional innovation policies uh, in which they are uh, focused on strengthening their their economic sectors. Or deploy um, or key to deploy innovation strategies within the region, uh, but I think that um, municipalities have they have uh, they, they know exactly what, which which are their, their needs. So they they have to focus on what are the needs now 
where the, the future needs. So, and also go along with these regional strategies, uh, national strategies or European strategies. And I think that it will be constrained by their competences also. Um, I think that there are issues as uh, Frederick or uh, Mauro was uh, mentioned it uh, before, uh, digitalization transformation, energy transition of the uh, local level, um, at local level are issues which uh, all the, the municipalities have to be engaged in the long, in the, in the short term, middle term. So there are things that uh, innovation procurement uh, will, will um, help them to, to go on on these, on these uh, big challenges of the, of the future. And I think um, they also have um, uh, many, many uh, European programs which help them to achieve those, those goals. And now we are going into the Horizon Europe. Uh, we have the Green Deal. I think there are many, many programs. Interreg is, is continuing. So I think that uh, they can um, uh, be um, supported by these, by these programs uh, on, on defining their, their innovation procurement policies for their own municipalities. Thank you. Very useful. You. And uh, Gaynor, I will go to you next. Um, well, I, I think I'll just take a slightly different angle on that in, in that procurement is rarely seen as a strategic tool to deliver policy objectives, you know, and this always surprises me, you know, and um, people have been talking about this policy procurement gap for years, but it still exists. And so every time I see a new policy document, I sort of get kind of this sense of anticipation. Will procurement and innovation procurement be highlighted as a tool to deliver these, whether it's transport, agriculture, whatever it is, is it being highlighted as a tool? Um, I, very, very, very rarely is that, does that happen, you know? And I, I, I'm just like, where's the procurement bit here? You know, where's the procurement as a tool? Um, I did once, I, I was looking through a transport document once, because I know we were doing a project called Transform, and searching procurement, innovation procurement, and it was like, yes, procurement is mentioned, and there was this little heading, procurement, there's a little paragraph, and I turned over the page, and it, <laughs> there was nothing else, it was, it was mentioned, but there was nothing substantial there. And I think if you could get innovation, procurement, and procurement through the policy framework, as a tool, then people would start to wake up to it and start to understand what's possible. And it also gives permission to a person in an organization to adopt that approach because it's been highlighted as a tool mm -hmm. in, their, in their policy document. Um, so if you took the example of say carbon reduction, I was working with a city and we were looking at how do you create an organizational culture in support of low carbon innovation. And there was no, they said, oh, well, we've set all these targets and yeah, but where are you monitoring them? Who's responsible for them? Is it, in, is it included in somebody's roles and responsibilities? So you've got that issue, but also most of the carbon is in the supply chain, all right? So unless you are, if you've got a, an ambitious carbon reduction target, you've got to work with your supply chain to reduce carbon in the supply chain. And you can only do that through a, a shifting the way in which you buy things towards provoking low carbon innovation, rewarding low carbon organizations and low carbon, low carbon um, achievements in the award criteria, uh, criteria. And I think unless you have that innovation procurement and procurement going across that policy framework as a municipality you're going to struggle to have the confidence to set ambitious targets let alone to actually meet them yeah i agree i agree with both of you i mean olat is pointing that you have to look into what is already out there into find find the the the, the 
the support that the current policies are offering you because there is uh, already uh, there are efforts from uh, policymakers to to have procurement help out in achieving all these uh, ambitious goals uh, gainer is pointing out that it's not sometimes it's not sufficient or often it's not sufficient often uh, if you don't have a very clear um, uh, outline of what the, the policy goals should be for procurement, you will still have the uh, um, different attitude of contracting authorities to engage and set for themselves uh, very ambitious uh, goals. Um, I'll go to Mauro because he's basically, I, I don't know whether uh, I can call you a policymaker, Mauro, please correct me in that, but I know your agency and your department is has a, a very, very good vision Vision, very solid vision on uh, on uh, role of policy and uh, how to support uh, small uh, municipalities. Yes, we are surely part of the uh, policy making system in the industry for what the government should be doing. So, um, first of all, uh, we I my feeling is that we need a policy framework because a policy framework that can really simulate rules, uh, have um, public administration at the moment try to better understand that they are in a, in, no, for, for, in the right way, but in a right way. Uh, and it's relevant. Uh, the policy framework means uh, some rules, uh, some money, uh, that is good. But in my opinion, what is really relevant is that a uh, policy framework uh, has to build a, an operational framework. That is a concrete, real framework uh, of supporting systems for, to, to, to set up uh, an innovation procurement process. Um, what does it mean operational framework for us? Uh, it does mean, okay, some tools, uh, but the most relevant thing, in my opinion, is to build a um, connection between the different entities that are engaged in procurement. Um, the, the fundamental part is that uh, to connect the, the innovation procurement, the, the, the entity that um, promotes that brings on the market the innovation program is connected with the uh, large central purchasing body that we, we have in Italy, a relevant network of uh, central purchasing because like to have is a system where the solution developed in a uh, specific situation, by example, by small municipality, can be uh, brewed in the large supermarket of the uh, central purchasing body so that the uh, innovative solutions can be brewed in an easy way by other administrations. This is uh, relevant for three reasons. From the demand side, because who makes a good experimentation can deploy their experience in other um, administrations, can, can uh, transfer their experience to another administration. And it's very effective also for uh, the economic operator, because they know that if they are engaged in small say standards or experimental standards or innovation procurement standards with a small uh, business size, you know, for example, performed by the small municipality, they have a complete chance to deploy uh, their uh, solution uh, on a larger market, on the larger market of the public administration. So their solution will be put uh, on the shelf of the supermarket uh, of the big uh, central purchasing body. In Italy, we have a, a national purchasing body that is quite well known, the next council. And, but we have also uh, tens of regional purchasing bodies, about uh, 20, 40, according to the uh, how many countries. Uh, 
and uh, um, some of them have uh, a business side of more than 10 billion euros by year for each year. So it's, uh, it's relevant, right? very relevant. Um, in summary, uh, having a, a policy framework and an operational framework that put in connection the innovation procurement with the let's say ordinary procurement that is the deployment of the innovation procurement is a key point for us for the success of innovation procurement. On the other side, uh, we have to say and to understand very well that policy can uh, let's say bias and uh, distort the the, the Genuine, the genuinity of the need. Because in some, uh, one, one um, interpretation, one possible interpretation of innovation procurement uh, is that innovation procurement is really demand driven procurement. But demand driven, demand driven means demand driven. And the demand, what is demand? Probably the demand is the concrete real world demand of citizens and companies uh, and the administration of the villages and so on. And uh, real world problems are often very, very complex problems because they involve human needs. They involve complexity, uh, social needs. They are not easy, not easy. Usually the market is very far from having uh, a, a perfect answer to the needs of people. So, uh, and this is the, the, the great trend point of innovation procurement, of demand procurement. If uh, a policy uh, is in some way um, change is the dream of demand driven because you put money, you put money, by example. And if you put money uh, on the bill, um, unfortunately, often, uh, someone uh, looks more at the possibility of adding funding for uh, its process and then solving the problem for which that money is put on the table. Um, so, Okay, we have to put uh, a lot of attention. Uh, in this moment, we prefer not to transfer money to um, municipalities or the uh, uh, administration that can benefit from this fund. Yeah. Uh, and the, the municipality have just to clearly uh, define which is their problem. Mm -hmm. And someone else we use the money for them in order to set up the center. Nothing is perfect. Also, yeah. this matter has some problem. But this is what we prefer to do now in this, in this, um, let's say in this period of our advancement in defining uh, a good uh, innovation. Thank you, Mauro. I think um, I will summarize because some some people are having difficulties in understanding you. Your your sound is uh, sounds a bit far. Uh, so what I uh, if I can summarize it shortly is uh, policy is very important not only for. Uh, giving the initial incentive stimuli, it could be goals, it could be uh, financial incentives, so giving money. At this stage, you have to be careful as a policymaker not to um, decide yourself for the contracting authorities which type of innovations they are uh, targeting, but to have genuine needs of the contracting authority being pursued. Um, but also uh, the role of the policy uh, maker is to build the connections between the relevant actors in the market and um, scaling up the innovations that have been tested by some contracting authorities and you can scale it up at regional uh, uh, level or national level through particularly in the case of Italy because in the Netherlands we don't have a central uh, purchasing body. Um, I would also add uh, what, what Gainer also mentioned is uh, having monitored 
having understanding how it's working this policy, whether the targets are, are being achieved and uh, understanding why they are not being achieved uh, or what, what are the, the key success, uh, success uh, uh, points. Um, I want to uh, summarize because I think we came uh, to the end of our session and uh, I would uh, only say that uh, it is um, uh, you should engage, you small municipalities engage, dare to engage. The first project of innovation procurement will be the most difficult, but anything afterwards uh, becomes uh, easier. As Gaynor said, perhaps if you don't dare to do the full, uh, full project, uh, start with uh, some of the steps that are recommended, engage your end users, get them at the same table, it's nothing fancy. Just have the people who are, uh, I don't know, mowing the lawn or uh, um, uh, talking to citizens, uh, having them at the same table to explain uh, to the purchasers in the organization what their problems are and how, because you will be very surprised that they have good ideas of how things could be improved. Look at uh, support uh, actions, look at your regional agency, look at your national agencies uh, to guide you in anything that uh, that can help you with knowledge or with putting you in contact, making you aware of any European projects that are ongoing on relevant topics. And uh, this is also a very nice experience uh, to have is engaging in a European uh, funded project with other contracting authorities from other member states. There's lots to learn. It's also you will learn that, uh, that, that the needs are absolutely not different. So they all uh, cope with the same uh, challenges and uh, the same needs. And um, yeah, engage, try to engage and find support within your uh, organization. Without that, of course, it will be very difficult to, uh, to pursue. And I will give the word to, to each of the uh, guests, each of the panelists for a final comment. And I will start with uh, Gaynor. Thanks, Romana. I, I, basically, I suppose it, it can, as you say, it can be difficult to start. Um, so just get some support, get somebody to help you through the process. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It can be done really effectively. Um, we did it through remote um, mentoring and re remote counselling, step-by-step process with the guys in Croatia, um, which was a fantastic project, great team to be working with there. And um, Remember when you're thinking about, oh, innovation's a bit risky, take into account the risks of not innovating. Thank you, Gaynor. Very, uh, very good uh, final word to make us think about it. Uh, I'll go to Olat. Okay, uh, yes, we'll um, say that uh, to take away the fear of doing things um, on a different way. That's the way that we have to, to go on. Um, yes, 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 that. And, and also, um, I think that uh, having someone to, to guide you, uh, someone who has already gone through these through this, um, processes is very helpful. Uh, so I think that uh, anything that you can learn from, from the next uh, webinars that are taking place uh, in this uh, uh, prominent MET uh, final uh, conferences, I think, I think it's, it will be very helpful for, the, for you to be uh, enthusiastic on, on engaging, engaging on this kind of, of uh, processes. Good luck. Thank you, Olaz. Mauro? Yeah, uh, sometimes we call things uh, in a more complex way uh, uh, than really they are. By example, we call we are speaking about innovation. Let's just think my suggestion to the procurer is just think uh, how different the way you buy in your family, in your real life, uh, and what you perform in your office. Uh, please try to put in, 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 in your office the same principle, the same behavior of, uh, that you have when you buy something privately. And probably that's the right way. 
Thank you very much for your, all the three of you for your inspiring uh, final words and encouragements for the contracting authorities uh, in the audience. Um, I uh, have two questions that I see in the chat. Valeria, do you want me to go through these two? Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the panelists. So now it's really clear how PPI can make the difference in small municipalities in order to improve the quality of, pub of public services and also the challenge we face. Yeah. We are ready for the last turning point. Uh, we, can, we can start, uh, we haven't a lot of questions. Uh, you have been too exhaustive, but uh, we, can, we can start for, for, from, for the first question. In which kind of sector the innovation procurement uh, can find uh, the wider application according to you and why? From Gabriela Ceccarelli. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the um, second one uh, uh, is um, the market uh, and uh, in particular small uh, SMEs uh, are conscious of the presence of the new tendering procedure and are they interested in applying uh, for them? Mm -hmm. So if, you, if I may, I will go first and I will try to be very short to give the others also the opportunity to reply. I think in my experience and uh, also from, from the EAFIC experience and the European funded projects that I've participated in and also being uh, um, uh, having the legal expertise and uh, uh, having the opportunity to be involved in different uh, projects in different sectors, what I notice is that there's absolutely no limitation to the sector that you uh, could think. Of course, it has to fall under the competence of the uh, uh, contracting authorities, but think of the health sector that's very, very, uh, 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 very high need of uh, innovative solutions from remote monitoring of patients to cover rural areas that don't afford to have uh, hospitals uh, to uh, agricultural sector to use satellite data to monitor any uh, fires or drought or uh, need to uh, to to monitor uh, uh, illegal cutting of woods uh, for, a, for for public authorities to uh, water management sector which in the Netherlands uh, as you know we are uh, very much under the sea level so we need this we have uh, but also in the waste uh, water uh, management area where um, you can find uh, opportunities in the sludge that you take out of wastewater to to transform it in, uh, into uh, products that can be resold, thinking about the circular uh, economy. So there's many, many examples of small municipalities who want to, um, um, not so applicable to, to Mediterranean uh, municipalities where the winters are warm, but in the north, we still have ice on the roads and having input from, um, from citizens on where they have to uh, put more salt on the roads and uh, combining data data uh, and artificial intelligence solutions to pre predict the need and to make sure they have already enough stocks of salt. Uh, about the market, yeah, we haven't discussed uh, how to do a state-of-the-art analysis. For me, this is also a key point as um, we use uh, artificial intelligence tools, luckily there are many uh, that you can choose from nowadays on the market, to identify which companies are, for example, patenting, which are protecting an IPR, and then you will immediately get access to a list of the innovative companies throughout the world and you will have an overview of what patents do they have are they relevant for your project and you can target them to invite them engage them look at associations of companies uh, you have uh, in Europe the ASME agency who has a, a, a network of 6,000 uh, small and medium companies that they are very willing to engage and uh, make aware of any call for innovative solutions. Uh, so um, try to be smart, make it publish and uh, engage in, in maybe trade, uh, uh, trade uh, associations and uh, make the market aware of, uh, and try to make it attractive for the market. Perhaps if you are too small, engage with the uh, national agency to find partners and uh, aggregate uh, demand. I will leave the floor to the other three uh, three uh, uh, panelists. Is there uh, anybody who wants to make a comment on this? Um, no, yes, referring to the sector of innovation, I think as Ramona was saying, it depends 
well, I think that any kind of sector is a, can can go on for 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 inno innovation. I think it's a matter of a, looking at what are the competences of the of the authority of the public authority that is going to launch a, that a procurement. Um, I, I will I will guess that a, for for municipalities. Um, things like um, any kind of services that provides that they want to be improved and they have a necessity and uh, of, of improvement. Um, I will say that all of them are related to, uh, to urban issues, uh, transport, um, education, um, uh, I will say energy efficiency, uh, adaptation to climate, Their services on on that particular um, services. So that's that's one thing. And um, related to the to the market engagement, I think that um, there are lots lots of, of um, enterprises, um, small and medium enterprises. Which, uh, for example, in Technalia, we we um, we manage to to make consortiums with them. So they can go on with uh, with innovative solutions. Also, um, uh, the thing is that you have to be aware of what uh, what kind of uh, public procurement uh, you are um, going or you are going to launch. Um, so they, they are interested on on going through the whole process of the of the procurement because if there is there is um, there is something that we haven't. Uh, um, talk before or mentioned before that um, it has to be uh, well. It was mentioned, I think, that that by by Frederick before that there has to be um, a wide um, how we, uh, a, a, a wide market, so they they are willing to to go onto this kind of of uh, of innovation. So uh, so they have to be to develop an innovation. They they, they have to be. It has to be a, a, a list um, um, knowledge of this uh, that, that the market is it's wide for them, so it's worth it. And uh, also, what what is uh, is happening is that they probably the SMEs are not familiar with uh, tendering processes uh, of this kind. So what we are doing um, in all the our processes that we are going on. Is just having a um, um, session with them when we publish the, the documents, the procurement uh, documents. So we go on with them. So it's very clear what kind of information we are uh, uh, looking for. What are they, they? What kind of information they have to provide to the to the municipality in this case? Um, so. So it's uh, so they are aware of what uh, what kind of uh, answers we are looking for. It's not it's of course they are they are uh, we are looking for for solutions. We are not looking uh, that solutions uh, to to the needs that we are we are, uh, we have defined. So it's another kind of a uh, way of of uh, answering to this uh, to the to the tendering documentation. Um, Thank you, Mauro. Yeah. So, what regard the the, uh, the sectors? Uh, I can um, make some data we have collected. We have collected about three uh, initiatives in the last few years in Italy, and forty percent uh, regard the, the sector of um, health, quality of life, and food. Is for us is a, a, a unique sector. So, and for the life, forty percent. And probably we have uh, an improvement, um, increasing of the sector regarding what we can call social innovation, that is a solution where um, citizens and people are concretely engaged, uh, both from the uh, Side of um, beneficiaries of the solution, but also they could 
engage as, uh, um, let's say, operators that they can uh, offer their own service. Um, the second question I've got uh, is about how small and medium enterprise can uh, have information about ten person works. I have an IRP. <clears throat> Uh, what is granted for me that is the role of innovation procurement brands. Uh, in Italy, we have built, by example, a, a central platform that is called the uh, and you can find there uh, most of all the initiatives about innovation procurement from uh, that um, involved uh, Italian public and um, I, we are quite convinced that the, the, the presence of a single point of reference for small and medium enterprise can be very useful. And they can be very useful also for the um, public administration and the small administration that can uh, put their own needs uh, on this platform. Thank you, Valeria. Yes, uh, thank you very much. We made our best to answer to all questions. And before leaving you, I have an important reminder, two important reminders. The 15th of July will be held the second dissemination conference, PPI preliminary phase from need analysis to open market consultation. And the second, and the 22nd of July, the third one and last one, PPI implementing phase from the procedure selection to works realization. A big thank you. This conference was a real success thanks to you with more than 100 registers and more than 2000 views from 10 different countries. So a big thank you to the participants, the partners, uh, the speakers, of course, uh, my colleague from Svilup Umbria and the backstage who make it possible, you know, without technology, we are lost. And so uh, see you soon. Stay safe until then. Follow us, um, Svilup Umbria, on the Facebook page and the, on the internet site. And uh, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Valeria. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Yeah. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye, Frederick. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.